right, so we're going to be kicking off the next segment of our program. This sec segment is going to be, you, we had so many great ideas of presentations for today that, um, you know, full hour-long sessions, we just couldn't fit everybody in. So we've looked to kind of shorten things up, do a little bit shorter forms, you know, you could say TED Talk, Petra Kucha style presentations, um, and fit in as many great stories from around the state as we can. So starting off, um, Brennan Fuqua uh, joined NCDOT in April of this year as branch manager uh, for the Integrated Mobility Division. Uh, as the manager of the newly formed program and project management branch, Brandon leads a team of motivated planners, engineers to develop safe, affordable, and innovative multimodal transportation opportunities throughout North Carolina. With the Integrated Mobility Division, Brendan is able to combine his passion for alternative modes of transportation with his unique background experience in roadway design, construction management, mixed with program management and policy development. Uh, presenting with him today is Brian Murphy. He currently serves as the Traffic Safety Systems Engineer for the North Carolina Department of Transportation and has worked with the traffic safety field for over 23 years. Brian has a master's degree in civil engineering from North Carolina State University. So please join me in welcoming Brian and Brennan. Thank you, Oliver. As Oliver said, I'm uh, pretty new here with NCDOT, um, but I don't expect you all to take it easy on me, so don't worry about that. Um, we're very excited to be here representing NCDOT, talking a lot about some of these really important projects, some of these, um, kind of as Heidi said, these are passion projects. These are all projects that affect us in our daily lives. So it's really important that we know this going into it and that the jobs that we do really affect the users of the North Carolina network. So um, with that, I'll move forward. Um, coming into this presentation, we thought it was important to get multiple perspectives from different departments within the DOT. Um, I'm here representing Integrated Mobility Division, uh, more specifically our newly formed Program and Project Management Group. Um, or Program and Project Management Branch. PPMB is much easier to say, so I'll probably reference it that way moving forward. Um, but I will talk a lot more about what the new division is, uh, what the new branch is, the projects that we're working on, and how we're looking to help communities grow their, um, their network through North Carolina. Um, but before I do that, I'll hand it over to Brian with Traffic Safety Unit so he can talk a little bit about the available funds and the projects that are being funded through uh, different funding sources. Thanks, Brendan. And do you have the clicker? Oh, good. You did. Thank you. My name is Brian Murphy. I work with NCDOT and the Traffic Safety Unit. So excited to be with you to talk a little bit today about some of the things that, uh, that we work on here in our unit. Um, really just want to kind of leave you with two things. One's kind of a just a high-level overview of kind of our funding sources and some of the types of projects that we fund. Uh, with the safety funds and then also give you a sense of some of the safety data resources that are available to you. Uh, before we get too deep, I do want to mention our strategic highway safety plan. That plan is kind of the visionary document at the state level that really kind of sets the tone for or the vision for how we will tackle traffic safety issues in the state. It is a multidisciplinary effort, a lot of diverse stakeholders. Um, I will mention that on Monday we kicked off the update of this plan and it was really good to see many of the same faces there Monday that are here today. I know Terry's going to be involved in the update, so we're excited about that as well. So we really want to capture all perspectives. It's engineering, it's education, it's enforcement, it's so much more than that. Um, and so one of the things that do come out of that, that plan each, each time we update it is there is a goal. So the goal that we're currently working under is to reduce all fatalities and serious injuries by half, by 2035, moving towards zero. I mentioned that plan because that does feed into the operations of our unit quite closely. Um, there were 11 emphasis areas um, that came up as part of that plan the last time it was developed, and three of those uh, overlap very closely with the work that we do in our unit, and that's around intersections, lane departure, and ped bike and personal mobility, uh, which is where I'm gonna focus, obviously, most of today's uh, talk on. Uh, before we get there, the reason that we do focus on those three areas is uh, that's because that's where the majority of our fatal and serious injury crashes are occurring. And so those are the ones that are, are most important to our unit. Those are obviously the ones that are most important to 
personal life uh, and health. So uh, over half of the, our fatalities and serious injuries are road departure type crashes. So that involves a vehicle leaving the roadway and typically hitting something. Uh, about a third of those are intersection related and then 15 to 20 percent are pedestrian and, and bicycle. Um, quickly kind of hit on the two main safety specific funding options that we have available to us at the state. Uh, the first one being the Highway Safety Improvement Program. Uh, so that's currently funded at about 79 million per year. Uh, those are obviously federal funds and we do have a soft cap on these projects of about a million dollars uh, per project. Uh, we can go above that but, but we we want to keep that there because we really try to keep the focus on low cost, high impact type projects. Um, these are selected primarily from benefit cost. That it's a statewide competition, so projects are submitted uh, for consideration and they are selected uh, for HSIP. They're selected twice a year. The other um, safety specific funding source that we do have is spot safety funds and those are, that's a state funded um, program. Uh, we have a smaller cap on those of about 400000 per project. Again, that's to keep the focus on low cost, high impact type projects. Those are, are, are primarily selected on benefit cost as well, and those are selected quarterly. So we do try to have um, very regular selections so that if a problem is identified, it has a chance to compete for funding and get selected quickly. Obviously with safety funding, if it's an identified issue, we want to be able to um, select that project for funding get the funding in place, get the project on the ground as quickly as we can. So our safety program funding targets look very similar to two slides I showed you earlier. Um, so our funding targets, which we, we have, a, these are kind of soft targets, but we do try to hit about half of our funding um, goes to roadway departure type treatments. Uh, about a third will go to intersection type treatments, and then at least 15% go to pedestrian and bicycle um, countermeasures and treatments. So this is something, this is a funding model that we put in place around 2020 or so. Um, and, and those projects kind of compete within each other within those bins. So roadway departure countermeasures compete with other roadway departure type projects. The VRU special rule, I did want to make sure we hit on this. I think there's been a little bit of confusion about this recently. So um, the VRU special rule, it is a, a federal rule. And it is um, basically if, if your state's fatalities are above 15%, then you trigger this rule. And so it, in North Carolina, we did trigger that, this rule this year. Um, it's important to note that it's, there's no new funding that's associated with this. I think that's been some of the confusion. Um, this is just merely you have to set aside 15% of your HSIP funding um, specific for vulnerable road user projects. Again, that aligns with the slide that I showed you a couple um, earlier that we're kind of already in line with that. Our funding model is already um, already kind of aligned with that 15%. Um, and then our approach, again, the federal rules kind of can come and go, but our, our funding approach is typically a little bit more stable. And so our, our current approach actually will likely uh, exceed the 15% requirement. Um, this 15% this VRU rule doesn't have anything to do with um, STI or SPOT projects or TIP projects, it's specific to HSIP funding. Um, so what types of projects do we fund with, uh, with, with, with safety monies? Again, the, the emphasis here is on low cost, high impact type projects, things that we can get on the ground quickly and have an impact. Um, when we talk about pedestrian and bicycle type projects, they, they generally tend to flow around three themes, the first one being visibility. So that could be lighting, markings, uh, signs, flashing beacons. Uh, there's a lot of different ways we can, we can get at this. Uh, lighting is obviously very important. Um, when we fund, most of the projects that we fund related to pedestrian and bicycle are crossing type uh, projects because that's where our data shows us that that's where you're more likely to uh, incur those, those fatal and serious injury crashes. So, the project types I'm showing you today will be uh, heavily in, in that area. Uh, the other thing, um, other area here is protection. So um, active control, that could be signals or pedestrian hybrid beacons. Um, speed management is important. Obviously, when we talk about pedestrian and bicycle uh, events, obviously the faster that the motor vehicle is going, the more likely that that uh, non-motorist may have a, a serious impact um, if, they, if they are impacted. And then finally, control. So this would be things like refuge islands, marked cross rocks, uh, leading pedestrian intervals. We're doing a lot of those, and we're doing some of those in a more systemic type way. 
Um, so the downtown Raleigh grid, if you've driven through there in the last year or so, you'll notice that pretty much all of those signals have a, a leading pedestrian interval um, component to them. And so finally, I wanted to, before I turn it back to, to Brendan, I do want to just mention a couple of resources that we have out here. Uh, I mentioned a few of the types of projects that we typically fund with, with safety resources, but uh, all of the projects that we fund, they are mapped and they're available. Again, this information will be available after the conference, but um, they're, they're all mapped. They're all there, so you can go there, you can click on them, you can see uh, what that individual project did, you can see what stage it's in, so is it, is it funded but in design or construction? Uh, or is it something that's already been completed? Um, all those are there. You can get more information on those uh, on those specific projects um, at that site. And again, we'll we'll we'll, we'll give we'll provide this information after the conference. Um, the other thing I wanted to make you aware of is pedestrian and, and bicycle crash dashboard. So I know many of you all have seen this. If you're an MPO and RPO, we kind of did the rounds uh, last year or so and um, promoted some of these things, but. Uh, this is a good way to get just kind of high-level statistics for a boundary, so an MPO, or an RPO, a county, a uh, division, or a municipality. And so when you select your, your boundary, your city, all the information around the outside kind of changes, and you can see kind of what your pedestrian and bicycle crash trends look like uh, over time. Um, and similar here, you can click on an individual pedestrian crash or bicycle crash, and you can get more information about that specific event. So all of those crashes are geolocated um, and available there since 2007. A lot more resources. This is a horrible slide. I don't mean to read to this. So I'm going to go through it quickly uh, and turn it back to Brennan at this point. But uh, those resources will be available um, in the presentation material after the, the slides. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> all right. and so. What I want to do, as I noted before, is talk a little bit. IMD has come the last few years and presented on several of our initiatives. Um, I wanted to give an update on what's new with IMD. And one, me, and two is our new branch, which is our program and project management branch. And what we're trying to do with this new branch is manage a portfolio of projects uh, with a focus on multimodal safety. We want to talk about infrastructure project development, shared mobility innovations, um, and we want to also maintain our multimodal data and use that in a very effective way in selecting projects moving forward. Um, as you can see by this org chart, innovations and data is underneath this branch. So what it's done is created a really unique group of research, engineers, planners, uh, development experience, all in one group where we're really going to be trying to focus on how do we get projects not only shelf ready, but shovel ready, and then in the ground for um, communities to move forward with as well. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit as I go forward. But I do want to focus on a couple of the things that we are doing right now. Um, and I want to start with some of the education pieces. For those of you who heard Eric speak this morning, education is essential for growing our bicycle and pedestrian safety and awareness um, throughout the state. So a couple of the projects that we're working on, I want to start with our Safe Routes to School non-infrastructure grant program. Uh, with this program, NCDOT is facilitating over $3 million uh, to 12 awardees over the last year. Um, this funding can go towards things. It's, it's kind of a very broad um, grant that can go to many different things, such as a Safe Routes to School coordinator uh, in different areas. You can also do marketing materials, uh, host events. You can do um, all kinds of different education pieces with this grant. Um, one thing I wanted to show is it's not just for local or regional governments. We also have health and human services groups. We also have councils of governments in here. So again, this is a way that we're trying to facilitate funds to get this education off the ground um, and out into our communities. The next one I want to talk to is our helmet initiative. Um, you may have heard about this. It's something that's really exciting for us. Um, it's it's a, basically a cyclical um, grant that we put out. We put out applications towards the end of the year. Uh, we receive those from different community stakeholders. This one's even more broad. It's local governments, firemen and police departments. Uh, churches, advocacy groups, anything like that. They put in applications for needs for helmets uh, that they can then use in their educational uh, 
events and hand out to kids um, while giving them something that promotes safety, obviously. Um, learning how to ride the bikes in a safe manner at a young age is very important as we're talking about creating the next batch of multimodal users um, in the state. Um, and this is just a slide to show the reach of it. Um, I, I want to go back real quick. This, this, uh, this program has continued to grow over the three years that we've had it. Even in the first year in 2021, we had 165 applicants and we gave out almost 12,000 helmets. And then in this last round, we had 290 applicants and gave out 23,000 helmets. So this is a very wide range program that's affecting a lot of people. And we wanna continue that moving forward as well. And then just to show the map, we're reaching everywhere and we wanna keep getting those blue dots bigger as we can on that map. And then the final thing I wanna promote is since we are at Bike Week Summit uh, and we've uh, really cherish our, our partnership with all of our advocacy groups at, and Bike Walk and See. I want to talk about and promote our publication and our um, delivery of the Motorist and Bicycle Best Practices for Road Safety Manual. This is a manual that's online and there's a bunch of different um, videos online. It's just an educational resource where many different users of different types can learn how to interact with each other. This is built towards both vehicle users and bike users and pedestrians. How do we use, how, what's the right way to interact when you get to an intersection? What's the right methodology for what you should expect the other person to do? And again, education is such an important thing um, moving forward. So with that, the other part of the coin is you've got to have the right infrastructure. And this is really important and this is, my wheelhouse that I come in and I'm trying to help uh, build within IMD. Um, we've been doing a great job and we're just trying to continue to build off of the momentum that we've currently had. So I wanna start with a program that's really exciting to us, one that we've just finished doing the initial implementation of. It's the Interim Des uh, Design Safety Project or you may have heard tactical and urbanism as a buzzword there. Um, what we did was we created a pilot project where we identified trouble areas, your mid-block crossings, your intersections that have had historical uh, fatalities or issues with bike and ped and vehicle interactions. And I come from a design background, a design and construction background. Creating a permanent fix for something like that takes forever. There's permitting, there's design work, there's all kinds of things that goes into it before construction. You gotta find the funding. What this program is trying to do is figure out how we can do temporary fixes, such as uh, the, your plastic delineators, um, your uh, temporary curb lines and things like that. How can we do that expedited design work and get that in the ground to, while it's not the best, it doesn't stop a vehicle. It will deter it, it will slow them down. How do we get that on the ground as quickly as we can in these trouble areas? Um, and what we're doing with this pilot is not only are we actually implementing some of these around the state, but we're also developing a process that we can uh, disseminate to all the different communities on, this is how you need to do this in a temporary situation uh, while you're finding funding for something more permanent, it's gonna be a better situation there. Um, like I said, we've already done the implementation part of this. We're expecting the final report within the next couple of months, and then we'll be working with our communities to, to pass that information along and help find areas where this would be applicable in their communities. Next, I wanna talk about what we're doing with feasibility studies and what we're really trying to do um, is create a pipeline of, of projects that we not only can get, like I said earlier, we don't want feasibility studies that we do and we say this would be a great project and then it sits on the shelf for five years while you're trying to wait for funding or for some sort of change. What we wanna do with these feasibility studies is also identify potential funding sources to get these constructed, to get, well, I guess you gotta start with, get them through the environmental process, get them through uh, the preliminary design and final design work here. Um, these feasibility studies, the example I have on here is 25 um, paved trail studies that are currently ongoing. They'll be going on for the next six to 12 months. And again, part of that feasibility study is where do we find the funding to do the rest of this? Um, a lot of those are the grants that HSRC talked about in the last one. IMD is always here to help facilitate that, look for different funding opportunities. 
Sometimes it will be uh, going through the STIP process. We're also here to help navigate that as it's complicated, and we're always learning on that and trying to get better with that process as well. Uh, but we do want that type of opportunity um, to be available to these communities. So again, you're not just saying this would be a nice to have, it's more of a how do we get this built. Um, so again, this is for paved trails. These feasibility studies can also include transit facilities, mobility hubs, uh, bicycle um, facilities, any of these types of projects that you're looking for being built in your community. We're trying to create a pipeline to help you out with that so you can build that into your plan moving forward as a, as a community. Um, there's two main goals on this when we're talking about implementation. One is going to be the incremental setup of these programs. We're gonna get a bunch of things ready through feasibility and then we're gonna find ways to fund individual projects, move them forward that way. But also getting these projects on shelf ready status, ready to move into the design phase, also opens up the opportunity to bundle these into something that is a much more substantial um, move. Um, one that we talked about in the last presentation is uh, moving through on these reconnecting neighborhoods and reconnecting communities and neighborhood grants. So I want to tell you uh, about one that we're going for that is involving the Great, Stale, Great Trail State. What we're doing is applying, uh, and we have a creative name, this is one of the best things about these grants is how good we are at coming up with acronyms. Uh, <laughs> But we're, we're working on the Growing Rural Equity Access to Transportation in North Carolina, or Great NC. Um, that's worth the consultant price right there, I think. <laughs> but with this program, we're applying for $75 million, and this is to get these projects from feasibility into a final design state, so they are ready for funding to go into construction. Um, this is, again, creating that pipeline of projects that we can move forward. Um, and these are all, there was a lot of criteria to the projects that went into this and they'll all be a part of the application. It's a long one and it's due in 10 days so we're all kind of sweating <laughs> right now. Um, but it's going to be projects that are connecting rural communities to either activity centers or other communities. Um, they're all within DOT right away so they're gonna have quick ability to move once we get this funding, um, not having to do that acquisition phase. So. Again, that's due at the end of this month. Um, we're hoping to hear early next year, probably spring or summer, if we get that. And then um, hopefully we'll get these on the ground moving quickly. The funds have to be uh, obligated by September of 2026. So that's pretty quick implementation for several hundred miles of trails if we get this award. Um, and then the last thing I want to highlight is something you're all aware of. I'm sure it's Complete Streets and what IMD's role is with Complete Streets and DOT projects. Um, just some of the highlights that we try to get with Complete Streets where we're achieving adequate bicycle and pedestrian safety or adequate, um, adequate roadways for all users is we're trying to reduce pedestrian and bicycle crashes in unsafe conditions, improve access and mobility for those without a vehicle, enhance the quality of life, providing transportation choices, and ensure that NCDOT has a transportation system that works well for everyone. Um, just to give a few updates on where we are with Complete Streets, um, we recently re uh, released new guidance trying to get these Complete Streets reviews early in the design process, so it's not coming to us in IMD at the 11th hour, and then we look like the guys who are trying to blow the projects up and add a bunch of cost to it. Um, we're working with our division folks and we've been very successful on getting this moving forward and making, um, making uh, progress there. Uh, just a stat, we've done over 500 project reviews in the last year for Complete Streets compatibility. Um, and then the last thing I wanna talk through is that we are working on a design flexibility toolkit that will be released later this year. What we'll be doing is giving this to our design consultants who are building these projects early in the design phase. And what we're looking for is the maximum uh, achievable um, infrastructure rather than the minimum acceptable infrastructure moving forward. So that's uh, something that's really important for us moving forward and, and a big initiative that we're taking as part of the Complete Streets Network. Um, with that, that's, uh, that's our update from IMD and Transportation Safety Unit. Does anybody have any questions or anything? Of course. Ooh, before we jump in. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and uh, 
move on. We're going to go ahead and make this quick and move on to the next one. And I'm going to use this as our as our plug for um, our social this evening. Um, so please join us at the social where you can grab these uh, presenters um, and ask them any questions that you might have. We also have a break coming up in a few minutes. But to pack as many of these uh, short sessions in as we can, um, we've kind of eliminated some of the Q&A time. So if you've got questions, hold those to the breaks or when we wrap up um, or just wait until we head over to the pedal factory for those. So thank you, Brennan. All right, so uh, our next guest is the founder and executive director of Asheville on Bikes. His work in bicycle advocacy started, uh, started by organizing a variety of underground bicycle events. The more he organized, the more he got involved with transportation policy and planning. In 2016, he left his career in public education and joined Asheville on Bikes as its executive director. Uh, in his time leading Asheville on Bikes, he impl implemented uh, an after-school bicycle program, launched the city's first tactical urbanism projects, coordinated candidate forums uh, and public outreach, manages Asheville Unpaved Alliance, and continues to host a variety of cycle-centric events, each with their own unique favor, flavor. Excuse me. Uh, please welcome Mike Sewell. Thank you. Yes, uh, I'm Mike Sewell, the executive director of Asheville on Bikes. Uh, we are a 501c3 advocacy organization, and our mission is to cultivate the culture of urban and commuter riding through advocacy, education, and celebration. So what our education most often looks like is our after-school uh, cycling program. Um, our youth program is designed to get the students in our community who are least likely to have access to uh, cycling up on bikes with uh, trained coaches and uh, help them develop the skills so that they can ride their city. Um, we often, most often, plug into existing organizations that serve the youth. So we can go directly into communities. Um, this program has been running at Asheville Middle School in partnership with the Asheville City Schools uh, Foundation for over a decade now. And we are now offer summer programming. We can take our curriculum and partner with other, a variety of other organizations um, in Asheville. Uh, in the middle school, the hours between 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock are very vulnerable times for uh, our youth coming up. So let's get them out the school door on a bicycle and riding interesting places with knowledge and joy. Um, there we go. We are also uh, advocates. Um, on your left is, or on your right here is a, is a program that we just won on Merriman Avenue. We get worked for a road reconfiguration. The conditions on Merriman Avenue, 150% more collisions on Merriman Avenue uh, than any other road like it in the state of North Carolina. And a resurfacing project was coming up, right? The, the, they were going to tear up the asphalt and lay it all down. And so we really work to say, whoa, 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 whoa. 150% and we're just gonna pull the same striping plan off the shelf and lay it out again for 10, 12 years. So we really worked to uh, reconfigure that road to make it a two lane with a center turning lane and add bicycle lanes. Uh, it's not perfect, uh, but it's better. It is more safe and it is more uh, humane. So we're really excited about that. We're also working on a complete streets project downtown in our city uh, to con uh, a, a quick build um, complete streets project. And this initiative, Asheville Unpaved, um, is a partnership between another NPO, Connect Buncombe, and uh, Pisgah Area Sorba and Asheville on Bikes. And we are going to build a series 
of multi-use natural surface trails in the forested pockets uh, of our city. So those students that I was just talking about, right, we can get them out on the road and they can be riding asphalt all day, all day. Um, but we're living in Western North Carolina and there's so many great trails and so many of the students that we are serving don't have access to those trails uh, for a variety of reasons. So if we can bring the trails in, into the city, it eliminates a lot of barriers and we have more access and more types of cycling experiences. And lastly, celebration. Uh, Ashland Bikes, we host a variety of rides. This is a picture of our Pumpkin Peddler. It's a uh, community ride, costume community ride. This snapshot was from last year. There were about 750 people uh, on this ride. It's free, it's open to the public, and it is also, uh, all of our rides are a significant tool in um, how we win campaigns and put things into our city that people are going to enjoy. So that's what I wanna talk a little bit about um, today. So I mentioned Merriman Avenue and you can see the bicycle lane and when we did our ride, the summer cycle, we did this spectacle spot. And we invited our, our participants along the ride to hop off, there was a bike shop right there, grab a sign and let's document your enthusiasm for uh, complete streets and rolling our, and rolling our city forward. Because you always hear the no one is ever using that bike lane, right? We hear that over and over and over again. So we want to have assets to be able to say, yes, they are, and they're really, really enjoying it. And I mentioned, again, uh, the Asheville Unpaved. Um, this project is right, there's the Asheville Middle School, right here. This is where our after-school bicycle uh, club runs. So this is one of the trails that we're beginning to fund. And although the Asheville Unpaved project is fairly popular with people in the city, this green area, it's, uh, it, well, this set where the, where the trails are, it's really underutilized. So that means that most of the public has no idea what, what exactly this is. And we know that if we can bring people to the place, make it two-dimensional thing, three-dimensional, we're gonna get people really excited about the possibility. So when we design our community rides, we were thinking about our advocacy goals and we were aligning a fun event with the information that we have to get out in the city. And so one of the way we do it, we use Ride With GPS. We publish our rides, our routes ahead of time. And we always do three different routes, the cruiser, the main ride, and the ride more. The cruiser route is about four miles, and it is mostly greenways, protected bike lanes, and bike lanes. And the main ride is the cruiser uh, plus active city streets and slow neighborhood streets. So it's kind of like a tour of the city. It's you know 10 to 12 miles. And the ride more um, is the main ride uh, plus some cycling hijinks, right? You're gonna climb a hill, get to uh, an awesome vista, go down, you know, at some point you're gonna be like, why did I sign up for this? And then you're gonna love it, and, right? And so it really appeals to all the types of cyclists. You know, you can bring your reluctant cycling friend to this and go to the cruiser and have a great time. Um, so when we publish our routes, we also are drop points of interest so that people can see the routes ahead of time and they can click on it and learn a little bit more. So they're, we're also, they're planning the route, but they're also learning about the work that Asheville on Bikes is doing. And I just took a screenshot of the views. So this was from the summer cycle, and the morning of the summer cycle, there were a thousand views before the ride. And these stay up. So what happens is like after the ride, uh, word gets out about it. People go back and like, oh, that was fun. Oh, I did the cruiser, but I'm kind of interested in the, uh, the main ride. They go back to it uh, lots of different times, and our advocacy is still there. So a percentage of our folks are arriving at our events prepared. Um, a percentage of them largely are not. <laughs> uh, but they, we, we, uh, they figure it out, and then after the fact, they go back and they use it. So every time they're looking at a ride, they're learning a little bit more about what we're doing. And then at the rides, we really activate the space. Um, so you can see over here, we have a pop-up bicycle park. 
uh, that's run. We've put our coaches in there and they kind of manage uh, the bike park. And then we make these kiosks right here. And this has the QR code to the route so you can take your phone and you can look at it. You can also study this poster and see what the routes are, the three different routes. And then on the poster, we have uh, information about the projects uh, that we're working on. And this is our board president right here. And he just kind of stands there. And like when someone asks a question, he steps up, <laughs> provides some information, and then uh, steps back. Additionally, um, we also put up the posters of what we're doing you know, before the ride. Uh, and the person on the left, um, he was the person who made Alex. He made uh, these signs, and he's a partner in this project. So he comes, I buy him a pint, he stands by uh, uh, the, the, the project, and he can talk in depth and knowledge, knowledgeable. People thought they were coming for a summer stroll around, but they're learning about their city, they're learning about the possibility, and they're learning the work that we're doing. And then lastly, what we do is this right here, all the green space behind the people, that's the, that's the project area. And so we create, there's a little trail, it was kind of a hiker bike, and so people come up and they make a left turn, and I've got people, that we would call them pedal patrols, and they're like, hey, welcome to Asheville Unpaved, come up right this way, welcome to Asheville Unpaved. So they're learning it, they're also kind of like, what, what, what's going on, what's Asheville Unpaved? Uh, but then they get to a point and we have another kiosk there and where people can see the project in its place and what's coming and then opt to uh, advocate. And guess what? There's Chris right there again, ready to answer any questions anyone might have along the route. <laughs> and so you want to give people a great time and something unexpected, an adventure. But at the same time, it's very important to respect and acknowledge where people are. How many of you have seen this graph and you're familiar with the, with the, with the types of cyclists? And so if you're going to be good, if you're going to be designing, you want to be thinking about uh, who your people are, what their preparedness is, what their readiness is, and kind of design from here, right? You can see sort of the ride more expressed in the strong and the fearless or the enthused uh, in the con confident, and maybe the main ride is designed for um, the interested but concerned or the, or, the, or the cruiser, giving people options on rides and letting them uh, pick uh, what they want to do is effective. And so how that looks uh, in real time, and this is a strategic thing that we did. So this is a footprint, uh, it's a section of the summer cycle. And I mentioned Merriman, and Merriman is the green line here that runs up to uh, Grace. And it is a pretty, you know, it's a commercial district. And for like 25 years, no one would ever ride their bike on Merriman because it was 150, it's terrible. It's a little bit better now. So I did not think that it was appropriate to be like, all right, everyone, we are going up Merriman. But I knew that the folks who are selecting the ride more are that stronger and fearless. They're more, they're more comfortable with that. But I also don't want folks to like not experience it at all. So the way I designed it was the main ride was gonna cross this street and the ride more was gonna take the left. So even if you're not riding on it, you're crossing it, but you're watching a percentage of those riders make that left turn up Merriman. And so you can look and roll across and say, oh, oh, maybe that is rideable. Oh, oh okay, um, that's something. And so they're still experiencing it. We're welcoming them back to the corridor at a safe and acceptable uh, way, way to do it. And never miss an opportunity to take a picture. Because now when people, oh, I've never seen anyone on Merriman. And I'm like, really? There's like, there was like 150 of them. <laughs> and we're, we're, what we're doing is we're welcoming them back to, to Merriman Avenue. This public right of way is for you. And we've got a lot more steps to go, but right now it's working and it is for you. This is for you. And so we always want to be pushing out, you know, safe streets, safe routes. Stop listening to the naysayers. This is a quality of life issue. Safe riding options have made my life better. Does that resonate with anyone around here? Right? 
And so what we're always advocating for is for streets that provide safe and dignity, safety and dignity on, on our public rights array for uh, all the users. And I would be remiss if I did not invite you to the upcoming Pumpkin Peddler on Saturday, October 28th. Again, it's free, it's open to the public. The routes are uh, already out there. Please come to Asheville. And if you're already booked up for the Pumpkin Pe or on the Pumpkin Peddler, uh, October 7th is the Tour de Fat uh, with New Belgium at um, New Belgium Brewing. And we would be more than happy to uh, host you then and there too. Thank you very much. Mike Sewell, Asheville on Bikes. All right. Next up, we have uh, Nicole Lindahl. Nicole is, has been the Special Projects Coordinator of Bicycling Greensboro since 2018. In this role, she has led, leads the organization's programs and related events, including bicycling advocacy, bike safety education, and efforts to increase accessibility of bicycles to those in need of transportation. She is also the founder and currently leading the beginning stages of Triad Friends of the Greenway, a coalition of organ local organizations and individuals advocating for improvements to the area's paved trails network. Nicole earned a master's in public affairs from the University of Greensboro. Please welcome Nicole. Hi, everybody. My name, as Oliver said, is Nicole Lindahl, and I am the Projects Coordinator with Bicycling in Greensboro. Um, and today I'm going to be talking to you about a new coalition that we have uh, just recently formed and are trying to get off the ground. So first, a little bit about Bicycling in Greensboro, or BIG, as we're also known. We um, have three major main focus areas in our organization. The first is advocacy. That's our primary focus. Um, we advocate for safer bicycling infrastructure. We also um, advocate for better laws for cyclists. We have safety education as well. Um, in fact, we have a thriving Learn to Ride program right now uh, that goes on bi-monthly, three seasons out of the year. And uh, we also put on bike rodeos and we've teamed up with Terry um, and Bike Walk North Carolina on their driver's education classes and several other things within our safety education. Changing gears is our effort to increase accessibility of bicycles to those who may not otherwise be able to afford them. So we work in partnership with a homeless shelter and we provide people with safety education, refurbished bikes, the safety vests, helmets, locks, lights, all that good stuff. So that's a little about us. Now for a bit of background on this coalition. Um, Bicentennial Greenway. It is a regional greenway that is 14.5 miles long. And it takes you from Greensboro to High Point, or vice versa. It does have... Um, the potential, and hopefully in the near future, it will be a little bit longer. Uh, it does have an, uh, a section in, in the center that needs to be completed, but there are plans in the works for that, so we're excited um, for that to come about. The idea for the Bicentennial Greenway came about in the 1980s, and it was constructed in the 1990s. It did not, when they were planning this greenway out, they did not include a maintenance plan. And if there's one thing, please take away from this presentation is it's, please, if you're planning a greenway, please include a maintenance plan in your plan. Because it is so easy, I have, I've come to learn to put off when you're a board of commissioners that, that is in charge of funding or you're even in the, the parks and rec department, put off fixing these problems for another time, another year, you know, it's when you don't have a plan and a set schedule, things get pushed aside, they become more expensive, they become a liability, um, and we are dealing with that now on the Bicentennial. So the construction in the 1990s was funded um, 
through a bond, a county bond. It was $12 million. Um, and I also wanted to add that multiple, it's very confusing for the people in Greensboro. In fact, the city of Greensboro gets a ton of phone calls um, about uh, the Bicentennial Greenway and its condition because there are so many entities involved in its maintenance. And it's the short-term maintenance that I'm talking about, the mowing, the trimming, all that good stuff. So Greensboro, um, the county owns the entire thing. But Greensboro takes care of the Greensboro portion. The county takes care of bits and pieces of the High Point portion. High Point also takes care of bits and pieces of that. And uh, it just, when you're, see, you, you're, you're running, you're jogging one day on the Bicentennial, you see a city of Greensboro vehicle and whose responsibility Whose ownership of the Greenway do you think that that falls under? Would be the city. So uh, it's actually the county's responsibility. And long-term maintenance is the county's responsibility. But there's a lot of confusion surrounding that. Uh, so we, um, we decided we were gonna take this project on because there's so many hazards along this Greenway and try to get it funded. Our advocacy committee which is a, just a loosely formed group of people that, uh, big members that uh, meet monthly and we implement our plan that coming month. Uh, we went out and we did a few rides. We documented all the hazards. We took pictures. We took locations, the coordinates. Um, we got those hazards appraised through the engineering department with the city. We also got them appraised through the county the total ended up being $2 million to bring the, the Greenway up to standards. Well, at this time, this was 2020, 2021, we were going through COVID and the ARPA funds were available. So the American Rescue Plan Act uh, funds had just, uh, Guilford County had just received 104 million and they had yet to allocate them. So we were like, oh yes, <laughs> perfect timing as far as that's concerned. Um, so we started our campaign for that, and we, uh, we worked really hard. We went to the Parks Advisory Board, we went to the Board of Commissioners. We worked in conjunction and keeping the Guilford Parks Department informed. Of course, they were on board with this idea because we were actually trying to fund their department. Uh, so we ended up Failing, so it did not go through. Um, ouch, right? So what happened was, a lot of worthy programs got the original funding, the, the first section, that we knew we were not gonna get funded out of, uh, and like EMS and all that good stuff. So the 41 million though, that's what we had our, our hearts set on. Um, and they put off telling us, so, it was, I think uh, it passed, they were supposed to let us, the public know on July 1st when the budget came out that year in 2021. And they put it off until September, I think. So we were like holding our breath for a really long time. Um, and uh, well, <laughs> it, they ended up divvying it out to municipalities. And the reason I included this chart here is because it shows you that they did fund parks but they funded parks through the municipalities that they gave the money to. So of course the county's own greenway did not get anything, which was a, a crush, it was a blow. So when you've, you do a campaign like that, you put everything into it, you know you've done everything right. You've, t you've done all the steps that you were supposed to do. There's no, no regrets. You know you're not gonna wanna do the same thing again because it probably is not gonna work. So we decided we'd come up with a coalition. We needed a number of people behind us. Um, and so that's exactly what we're trying to do. We are trying to get um, as many organizations and individuals on board and mem as members representing this coalition as possible this is kind of, there's like two ways that you can form a coalition. 
One is you can keep it under your umbrella as an organization, and the other is, is that you can um, make ownership kind of uh, an even, uh, everybody has a bit of a, a piece of the pie, I guess. Um, and that's the route we went. So this, is, this coalition's not under Big's umbrella. We don't want it to be. We're, I'm actually working really hard to separate myself from it and the group from it. What we want is for people to feel ownership of it, for organizations to really want to come to the meetings so that they can help us, of course, get more people involved with recruitment, and also so that when the time comes for us to go to the Board of Commissioners in the spring, that we have those numbers, that we can come out in full force, and that it won't be like it was when I was trying to get the advocacy committee to come out, me begging everybody on the phone. This is going to be something that we all put a lot of effort into, and um, hopefully everyone will come out. And, uh, and there's so much enthusiasm so far. Everybody's very excited about it. So, um, our, as I just said, our main goal is to get the numbers. We've already put on a number of events. The thing is, though, is that while my goal personally is to get the bicentennial fixed, it is now everybody's organization. So it is up to everyone what, what focus we have as a coalition, if that makes sense. So I th regardless, if, if for whatever reason, the members of this coalition decide in the future that this is not the route they want to go and that they are, they're not trying to fund Guilford Parks more than they, you know, to, to fix the hazards, then that's the way it's going to be, and we'll do something, other valuable service project, and Big's Advocacy Committee will just have to go about this a different route. But um, I have a feeling that we are going to pursue that goal. And uh, I'm pretty excited about it. We are having, um, uh, let's see, let's see. We've actually gotten a number of organizations on board so far, but we are going to be trying to diversify. That's our major challenge, is framing the issue so that we can get others on board. You know, the unlikely partners. In fact, I got horse and rider. I was pretty proud of that. But <laughs> So it's a start. Um, so it's, it's coming up with that story, that connection, that reason why they would care about the Greenway and pursuing it like that. So anyway, this is probably a little premature, us having a presentation about it. But uh, I hope to come back next year and have a ton of stuff to talk about and a lot of uh, uh, wins, right? So my contact information is up here. If any other group or representative from a group um, decides in the future to, to start a coalition, please reach out because uh, I have a lot of uh, stuff I could talk to you about. All right, thanks, y'all. Great, thank you, Nicole.